Some of that jargon. Okay. All right. So, where do we lie on this spectrum? Well, reality is probably somewhere in between. And so, the good old United States of America is probably somewhere over here, having some freedom, right? So more of a let the individuals have more choice probably is somewhere this direction. When we talk about the right and the left, the Trump and the Hillary's, the whatever, we're kind of waffling between kind of here <laughs> and here in terms of the amount of control that we're putting into one particular office. And you, what's your name? Michael. Michael kind of brought that up with the balance of powers. I mean, a lot of people who don't follow politics don't get it that whether it's Hillary or Trump that gets in the office, they can't just, they're not a dictator. They're not going to be able to overturn all the laws and make things change like that on us, right? So we've got Congress and, and then uh, our legislature with the, the court system. So all of that creates that balance of powers, the checks and balances. The reason why we might have a lot of gridlock, you've heard that word gridlock in Washington, is intentional. We don't want the rule of law being overturned too quickly, depending on the whims of whoever comes into office. We don't really believe in a rule by man, by humans, I mean female and male alike. We don't believe in the rule of man. We believe in the rule of law. So our country is more built on the rule of law, so that no matter who gets into office, we kind of understand the rules that we're playing on, so that when I'm making decisions, maybe at like yourselves as a 20-something after you've graduated college, that the rules of the game, if you're looking to start your own business, will likely look pretty similar 20 years from now. So when you're doing long-term planning, even if the office of the president has gone back and forth, Democrat, Republican, Democrat, Republican, or whatever, it doesn't really pertain much, right? So there's kind of this stability that comes about through governing by the rule of law. So real important in the United States, and that's what puts us more on on this end of the spectrum. We start going this way, and we're gonna get into uh, Cuba, probably the better example is almost North Korea. Uh, what's his name, Kim, right? So we got North Korea, Fidel Castro. Again, they tend to rule by committee. There's some powerful people. It's not just every single decision is on one person, but it's kind of flowing this way on the spectrum. Now we move into the middle and we get to a little more socialist countries like France. So socialism tends to live a little bit more in the middle. Communism tends to live a little bit more over here where we all own things jointly. Almost everything's owned by the government. So it's a little closer to the king and queen if we get back into the uh, history where the kings and queens ruled the land, they owned everything and the peasants worked for them. And then over here, we tend, and I'm kind of using overlaps here, right? There's not a perfect break, but we have capitalism. And capitalism is simply a belief in more individual ownership. We're not gonna have a belief system that we should have ownership mostly residing within an individual, right? Within an individual, not within a collective government where we've had, uh, maybe we've, through democracy, by the way, France is a democracy. Uh, North Korea is not so much. They might pretend that they're a democracy. But once we start to drift this way, there can kind of almost be these fake democracies, like they hold elections, but they're all rigged. Uh, that we had to have in Egypt. Uh, before the Arab Spring, it was like, oh, the same guy wins every time. Well, I wonder why, because the election's rigged, right? So they, they have kind of a democracy, a fake democracy going. We start to drift this way. So with uh, more socialist and communist regimes, we're thinking more about collective ownership. Collective ownership through government. Which might sound nice, in some ways. Oh, can't we all share everything? Maybe if we all put our heads in the, in the same place and we can kind of figure this thing out, we'll all equally share everything. Well, 
it runs into issues, and we'll kind of explore some of those as we go through. But that's the general idea. Uh, collective ownership, what usually happens as we move to this is the ownership of things will start with, um, with kind of big industries. So usually, usually big industry for starters. So we might think of oil. The oil industry is owned by the government. All the oil is owned by the government. Right? So we got Venezuela is, is a country like that that's in shambles now, even though they're completely oil rich. So maybe the government owns the oil. They don't let private companies have property rights to the oil. The government lays claim to all of it. So oil, uh, auto, air, we get into the air and, uh, airplanes and whatnot, uh, steel. <coughs> You know, some of the major industries that we've seen evolve in the United States through um, wealthy people like the Carnegies and Mellons and, and shipping and all of that stuff, it was private ownership that brought that, uh, brought that up through the American system because we continued to allow people to do their own, own thing and uh, um, do it in the way that they saw fit. All right, so questions or comments on that? Does that help bring, I mean, uh, some of these words I know are completely foreign to a lot of you guys. Does that help at least think about that spectrum on what these things are? Questions or comments? All right, so that I wanted to tee us up for this market system because since we live in the United States, which is uh, a market-based system for the most part, uh, it's not a free market. Um, we know that. Um, it's not free in the sense that there's never kind of government involved in something or other. That's why it's, it's this way on the spectrum a little bit. It's kind of a mixed market system, but for the most part, we still hold to the belief that we'll allow the individuals and individual businesses and stuff to make and own most of those, most of those decisions. Um, through the Obama era, which direction have we headed? on my spectrum here, because right and left is kind of backwards in this regard. Have we headed this way or that way? We've headed this way, right? Clearly with Obamacare, uh, thinking about more of those decisions being centralized. So we tended to have a little drift this way. And so we'll see what happens. Um, uh, again, to me, the drift, I think in some people's mind, they think it's crisis and they think we've drifted from here and now we're Cuba, boom. I don't, I don't think so. I think it's, it's a drift and that drift is, has uh, kind of continued over time. We'll see some data later if we think about the spending that the government does in the on our island. If we think about the spending that the government does, uh, they're up to about 20, 20%, 25% of the spending that's done in the United States in the government. 20 years ago, 30 years ago, it was less than 20%. So. If we think about how much spending is the government doing as a fraction of the economy, the drift has clearly been this way. So something to think about, is that the way we should have? Well, that's, that's up for discussion. That's what makes economics fun, because we can have different opinions, hopefully going back to the data uh, to support that either way. All right, so um, Adam Smith was the guy I wrote on the board last time. He was kind of the father of economics. And he brought about this idea of specialization that comes about through letting individuals uh, do their own thing. It allows them to specialize in what they're good at and then to trade at what they're not good at. And so um, today we're gonna look at that at a country level. And so in your mind, I wanted you to, to kind of think about the capitalist system this way, that what we care about in society are the people, the households. So on one side of the island, I shouldn't even say the side, we've got households that are spread throughout the whole island. But when we think about business, we've got buyers and sellers, right? And so the buyers are usually consumers, people who live in a house, they run to Walmart and they buy stuff. That's the exchange in a capitalist system. We've got businesses and we've got households. And so from a general construct of what are we trying to do, what, what's our objective, we're trying to make these people as happy as possible. 
right? The dictator will often claim, if you talk to Kim in North Korea, he's doing what he thinks is best for the people, that this way of organizing life is best for the people, right? So even on this side of the scale, uh, the perceived objective might be, might be similar. So how do we bring that about? Um, all of the people here, which on our island is about what? What's the population of the United States? Roughly 300. Who's got a better? It's a little higher than that. I have 300 down here. I should have said 300 million, 300 billion, 300 zillion, 300,000. How many people are on our island? 1,000, million, 300,000, million, billion, zillion, million. Bingo, I heard that. So million, 300 million people are living on our island. So I got this as a little a key. Uh, this is the slides that I was asking you to print off. They're on My Econ Lab. By the way, I meant to say My Econ Lab. How many people are in My Econ Lab? Woohoo! All right, nice. I didn't get a chance to check my list. I had a phone conference call that went a little bit longer before class. So, how many people are not in My Econ Lab? Okay, I see a few hands. You guys, drop dead date is before class Friday. Get in there. But that's drop dead date. Actually, remember, well, no, that's not true. Drop dead date is tomorrow. Why? We have assignments. We have assignments due tomorrow already. So the drop dead date is not before class Friday because you'll be late on your first assignments. How much does it cost to get yourself into my account lab? What's the minimum price that you could potentially pay to at least get in there? Zero. That's right. It's free. So get in there. Get registered. You have a 14-day free trial period. So if you're waiting for money to come in or whatever, I don't want any excuses. Your first homework is due uh, Thursday. Actually, I, I think I put the getting started thing due Wednesday, didn't I? Or did I keep everything Thursday? Okay. okay. It's all Thursday. All right. So getting started uh, teaches you the tools about Mike and Lab and then the math the math quiz is due uh, tomorrow. So get in there, get registered. Glad to see that most of you are. All right, so we got 300 million people on the island. Businesses hire people that they think will help contribute to the bottom line, right? When people are making the hiring decision, it's not because you got a nice smile and, and you look well. They're kind of thinking a little more profit-minded. Are you going to work for my company? Are you going to help me make money? Right? And by you helping me make money, I'll pay you some money to work for me. And so I like to think of these businesses over here as a collection of individuals that are doing what they're best at according to their skills that they either have by nature or by going to school like you guys are doing. Right? So it's a collection of human beings. I have this color coded so that we never forget that the reasons we do things in the economy is for all people in the United States, about half of those people choose to work during the day. So of course these little guys, the babies and kids, uh, we got rid of the sweatshops a while ago for better or for worse. Uh, although if you're a farm kid, how many farm kids do we have? Oh, good handful of farm kids. Were you guys doing some work at age 10 on the old farm? Yeah, so we haven't completely gotten rid of child labor by the way. Uh, those urbanites out there, uh, child labor is still alive and well you know, on, the, on the United States farms. Um, so that might be happening to some degree. But for the most part, we're talking uh, 16 years of age and older are, have these blue, blue suits on. And it's just a reminder that at the end of the day, these guys uh, check out and come over here. Um, the reason I set it up this way is historically, uh, the, this is called the circular flow diagram. It would look like this, and in fact, your textbook has something that looks like this. Households and businesses, businesses over here, households over here. I always felt like that kind of pitted us as them, corporate America, me, myself, bad guys, good guy, you know, kind of this fighting thing. And that's really not a healthy perception for maybe a number of reasons, but most importantly is to think that in a country where you have mobility and choice, um, you choose where you want to work. If you don't like them, you quit and go elsewhere. So 
Um, these people are just choosing for eight hours to earn a paycheck there to specialize in what they're good at. Okay, so that's the setup here. Businesses, households. Oh, maybe one last thing that I'll say. And you can't really see it on the, on the sheet very well, but the households own all of the resources. Land, labor, capital. Capital is what type of things again? Money. What's that? Money. Money, no. That's the one we don't want it to be in economics class, by the way, Lance. You're, you are right if this is finance class or maybe a business class. They might say, oh, well, we're going to go off and raise some capital. And they do mean we're going to raise some money. In econ class, we're going to drill that down a little bit deeper because that money is usually used for things like what? What is capital in econ class? Yeah, something that helps you make something else. A little bit more specific because a person helps you make something else, but it's not the person. Machine. It's a machine, materials, a building, a computer. I, resource, the resource is a little too general because all of these things are resources. But what's that? Man-made man -made things. Good. So I, I kind of gave you the, the impression of thinking about man-made things that help you make other things, right? Those things are capital. Now, what's a little more weird, though, is if we think about those things like this building, for instance, or the building of a business and the machines that are in there, I'm claiming that those are owned by the household. So I'm trying to think, don't, doesn't the corporation own it? Do businesses own things? Do corporations own things? That's a little bit. You guys have had maybe some other business classes, so I'm kind of asking a little bit of a technical question. In most cases, like board, so I mean, they would be specific Okay, good. So they're helping make decisions about the entity. Can corporations own something in the United States? Can they hold legal title to a car, for instance? Can a corporation own something like that? Yes, they can. So corporations can own. But oh, well, wait a second, Russ, that kind of throws your theory out. And I say, no, it doesn't. Why? And it goes, it's not quite board of directors. Board of directors are helping with the decisions. They get that money from customers. They get the money from customers, yes. And then track the, what's that? Investors. Investors, right. So who owns the corporation? Investors or the owners, the shareholders is what we call them, that you might have saw in some other business classes. So corporations have shareholders. Sometimes, by the way, those shareholders could be another company, is a shareholder in another company. But then that company has shareholders that are people. As, as you keep unraveling that, the unit of measurement that we eventually get to is a human being that goes home at night and wipes their butt just like every other human being, right? A real, living, breathing person. So... Ownership of all resources, including everything a corporation owns, right? all the tractors, buildings, office supplies, computers, everything that's owned out there comes back to an individual, kind of our unit of measurement, especially in the United States. We believe kind of heavily in the individual, right? We get into uh, Asia, and they might believe a little more collectivist that it's all family ownership. Right? So they might have a little bit bigger picture of that. But we can boil that down to human beings either way, in either system, by the way, that the ownership of that stuff resides with the people. So the people own their own labor. That one's an easy one. The people own the machines, the capital. The people own the land. So the land kind of falls into the same category, right? That you have access to that land. And then we have the entrepreneurship. So we have land, labor, capital, and entrepreneurship as our four basic resources <laughs> in society. All of that being owned by people over here. But they don't really give a rip about those raw resources in and of themselves. And they care about beer, pizza, and chicken, right? They care about the outputs, the, the, the stuff that we consume that actually brings us joy and happiness. And so they need to transform themselves. If we think about a self-sufficient, uh, since I brought up farming, I mean, this was a classic thing 200 years ago, um, people were pretty much subsistence living, right? 
They owned their own little farm. They had a cow. They had a chicken. They raised some crop. What they made is what they ate, right? And so how did we get into this system of having uh, Hormel make our bacon for us rather than us raising our own pigs? It all came back to Adam Smith with specialization, is that if we can work together through the impersonal marketplace, notice what's kind of awesome that you probably don't think about in the market system is that we deal with people who don't give a rip about us all the time. The owners of Hormel don't know me, I don't know them, but they sure help me out when I cook some bacon. Uh, I think I'm doing that later on this evening. I'm gonna, I had a request from my wife to make our bacon bits, so that's, what, that's where this Hormel thing's coming from. So they help me out a lot, that I can just go run down to the price shopper, shell out $3.99, and get myself a big old pound of bacon. That's pretty sweet, right? So, that type of thing is really specialization because the Hormel folks had found it profitable to do that because they happen to be good at bacon making for whatever reason. I, hopefully you will agree, am decent at giving a lecture on economics. So I specialize in economics, go run to the store for Hormel bacon. The people who own Hormel send their kids out to a university and I teach them about economics, right? It's a trade, that's the market system at work all coming to us through specialization as a way to uh, maximize our income as well as ultimately our, our wealth. Okay, questions or comments on that setup? So here is the flows. When we talk about the market system, there's really only two markets in the, the most kind of aggregated form. Remember that aggregate is like everything kind of combined together, all summed up. Upstairs is the one you guys are especially familiar with. So we go run over to Walmart and we pick up some, some of our favorite beverage. That favorite beverage comes traveling over to me. Before they give it to me, they got a cash register thing and I fork over some money, right? That exchange, is what economists call the output market or the market for final goods and services. Final goods and services. So that has its own supply and demand curve where the supply of stuff is coming from the business. The demand for stuff for those final goods and services is coming from the households. So they interact, make a trade, and both are made better off. Hopefully, which I'll maybe show a little bit later, but uh, then we'll take that for, for granted now. Maybe, maybe let me play on that a little bit. So I do want to make sure that our both people made better off in this system of capitalism where we have voluntary trade back and forth. In other words, did I make any money? Did I have any value added for this that I purchased from Walmart? Yeah, how much was it worth to me if I paid, if I paid, uh, let's just say three dollars for this? How much was it worth to me? Three dollars? Not quite the right answer. In a market-based system of trade, how much was this drink worth to me if I paid three dollars for it? And maybe more importantly, how do I know I didn't get screwed? Local happiness, probably. happiness, yes, brings into it. So what is my value in terms of dollars, though? I paid $3, but what's the value of this drink to me? How many times do you have to add up versus the value of the water? This is kind of a bad example. I was trying to make this like this is a one-time thing, like a soda. Uh, so you went, you went a different which just kind of complicates it more than I want to, but you got the right idea. I was thinking about how I'm going to utilize it over time. If it was a water bottle, it'd be a little bit longer than maybe satisfying my thirst in the next hour, right, if I just bought a soda or something. If I paid three dollars, what is this thing worth to me in terms of dollars? Three dollars, I heard that one, but that's not quite the right answer. I want a fuller answer. I want a better answer than just three dollars. What's this thing worth to me if I bought it for $3? How much more? 
the time, we might have to consider that, but still that, what is it worth to me considering the value of time? I'm at least, thank you, Ashley. That's good, that's worth an extra credit point, thank you. That is, so I remember when we read over the syllabus, I reserved the right to, to uh, reward some, some answers. So Ashley gets the first kicker there. So what do you mean by at least three dollars? Explain yourself a little bit more. Well, if you're willing to pay six dollars for the only have to pay three, you're still worth six dollars. That's right, right? So in a sense, I made a profit off of it, didn't I? If I was willing to pay six for it, but I only actually paid three, I profited off of it to some degree. That's a microeconomic concept. This might be ringing a few bells for those of you at micro. That was that consumer surplus idea. But in a sense, I got more value out of it than what I paid. We can kind of think of that being like a, like a profit. Now, how do I know that my value was at least $3? This one's a little trickier. Because you chose to do it good, right? So it's a voluntary decision. I didn't have... The dictator here, the government telling you, you must buy that thing. I don't want to buy it. Too bad. The rules of the game, the rules of the law, the law set out to buy one of these per day. All right, fine. If I don't want to go to jail for it, here's freaking three dollars. I get it. Of course, the value to me might not have been zero, but maybe it was only a dollar. Right? So if the government forced me to do that, or somebody else it doesn't have to be the government, but if I was forced to drink this thing. I very well might not have had a profit on it, right? So a key ingredient to the market system working is that we have voluntary behavior. People are making their own decisions. They're not forced into anything. And by knowing that, that it was voluntary and I purchased it, I can safely claim that I as the consumer profited, so to speak. There was a value that was at least $3. It might have been $3, but likely it was actually more than 3 so we had some sort of additional value. Questions on that little concept? This one's a little bit easier, I think, on this side. We know that Walmart is making some money on this, right? I mean, they don't usually do that. However, do they make money for sure on everything they sell, every single unit? No. If it's been sitting on the shelves too long and they need to get rid of it, and uh, maybe they've been running this for a while, maybe they made some money on the previous units, but on this particular day, when they have 90% off, Maybe that's less than what they paid to get it. So they might not have profited. But again, that was voluntary on their part. So I shouldn't even say this, but if they bought the inventory of bottles a year ago and it was sitting on the shelf and they've got 10 of them left and they're like, gosh, let's just get rid of these things, right? We paid the money a year ago for them. It's gone. Let's just voluntarily say we're going to sell it for 90% off. So we're going to let this thing go for 30 cents. It was three bucks. It's going to be 30 cents today. Well, if the money spent before, aren't they kind of profiting 30 cents? Because their new value on it is something less than 30 cents. It's probably zero. Like, if these don't sell today, they're going in the garbage. Can. <clears throat> or I'm going to donate them to Goodwill. Right? You get kind of that mentality. See how that decision making is at the, at the margin is what we call it in, in micro that you guys will get exposed to later. But that decision, the valuation of goods is not just the prices that are there. Values exist outside of the pricing system. The pricing system ends up being something that the two parties strike as a mutual deal. In other words, we get a win-win situation. The consumer wins the business wins. The market system of this person giving $3 to this person is not what economists call a zero sum game. Walmart wins, this guy loses, this guy loses $3, this guy gains $3. That's not the way it works at all. In fact, what we learned is that it's a win-win situation. The consumer won $3 the way we said it, if they were willing to pay $6 and they only had to pay $3, the consumer made $3, and Walmart, whatever they markup was, if this thing maybe cost them a buck or something, maybe they made a couple bucks. And both parties made money on it. That's the beauty of the market system. That's the value that voluntary trade brings to the table 
and why the United States has chose to have individuals own their own things and have the right to sell, buy, trade, destroy, you own it. The government doesn't own it. On a day-to-day -day basis, you make that decision because that'll create more and more win-win situations for the agents. Okay, questions there, comments? All right, so this market down here is called the resource market. Um, so the resources are listed here. We've got land, labor, capital, and entrepreneurship. Remember, the households own them, so they are now selling them to businesses who want to squish them together in a different way. Uh, everybody doing maybe different pieces of the puzzle so that they can make their bottle. So we take the land, labor, capital, entrepreneurship, we transform it into a bottle of water to add value to society. In exchange for those resources, of course, they have to pay for them. Payments like what? Wages, rents, interest, profits, all the payments that businesses make that are on their cost sheet, those are all flowing through the resource market. That's it. The market system kind of comes down to these two concepts all tied into the production and con consumption concept, where we've got the output, what we ultimately desire is those finals and services, and how did that happen? Through the transformation of raw resources into those things. The resource market, the output market. Okay, comments there? All right, so, Let's see, I think, I'm not sure if I want to do this, but I think I will to give you, I don't want to leave the government out in the cold. I did include the government there so that we have that basic concept of the market system. When we have a government in place, the government needs resources too. Ultimately, those resources are going to be channeled this way instead of there. So there's kind of this sharing process. Now, I don't want you to think, well, I do kind of want you to think in some circumstances, <laughs> that the government is taking away resources from the businesses. That might be true under some circumstances. But if we go back to anarchy, if we go back to anarchy, and we instead replace it with a rule of law, that needs some resources, needs some taxes. Okay, I'll just cut to the chase. They need some taxes in order to set up the law, maybe have some policemen, hire some court people, uh, judges and attorneys possibly, although we'd probably try to minimize that as much as possible. All right, but imagine starting scrap from scratch here and saying, what do we want that to look like? Is that the government taking away in, in the sense that I was just showing here, like the, the slide before, is the government just taking away? Think about that for a second. Does the government, starting from this starting point, bring value? Yeah, they do. What do they bring? What, what, what did they start to bring to the table that might actually increase resources, possibly, but also re we uh, increase the exchange, the amount of trades that can go on. Security. Security, good, right? So one of the things that hold back a lot of countries, especially in Africa, is the security aspect. If you can't use your property without the risk of it being stolen, then the whole trading system falls apart, right? So a very important ingredient is indeed the government, to a certain extent, to preserve and protect things like security. What else? What's that? Structure. Structure. Okay, what kind of structure? Like, I mean, you're right. Like laws. Yeah, laws into place on how, what the rules of the game are. So when we have, um, when economists have stuck exchanges with people with limited government, they start to form their own rules. And in fact, the United States is this way too. Um, communities, local communities, would start to form their own rule system, even if there wasn't a police system in place, right? Why? Because they found it mutually beneficial for trade to have a system of rules that they all agreed to. So that's essentially what we do, scaling things up at the national level to have at least some basic rules in place. And what that does is it allows people to really flourish 
with doing what they're best at and adding value to other people's lives. And so um, I thought I'd put that as a side note because you're going to hear me be potentially critical of government at some point because if the government gets too big, there's a tipping point where it does start to take away some of the individualness. So we start here, yep, yep, things are good, things are good, and then, then wait, maybe the government should do more, maybe the government should do more, maybe the government should do more. And some of the outcomes that we get, I'll just jump to the extreme, I jump to Cuba, what kind of cars are they driving in Cuba that you guys have seen on some of the documentaries, especially since Castro died? The old ones, yeah, like they still, since we did the, put in um, sanctions on Cuba, they still have automobiles from 1955, 1958. They just have to keep doing them because there's no trading, there's no value allowed, right? So the kind of optimal point in society with the level of government, there's lots of increasing returns, but at some point, the government, if this is size of government, it gets too big. And so we get kind of this hump thing in terms of, let me put smiley face on the horizontal, on the vertical axis. So we're measuring happiness here or something. We get to the point where, yeah, having some structure, having police, having security, that's added a lot of value, added money to the economy, added exchange, added wealth. But we can't, the answer isn't always to keep going back to the government because we eventually get to this point where the government might start to serve itself. It might start making itself happy, um, but not necessarily the general public. Okay, comments or questions on that? So here's the functions of government. Here's how they make money. Let's start with taxes. If they go to the output market, what kind of taxes is T2? What kind of taxes do you pay at the cash register? Sales tax. sales tax, right? So you have sales taxes coming in at the cash register. That's one source of tax revenue in general. In this type of market, that's the only source of tax revenue. The other source of tax revenue is on your paycheck that you guys might have seen on some of your pay stubs, right? So the government or the business pays you a hundred dollar paycheck, and then ten dollars of it gets derailed to the White House. You get ninety of it, right? Hopefully, the government's using that ten dollars to do good things that makes your life better, that adds value, blah blah blah. But sometimes that might not be shaking out that way. But those are the only two ways in a market-based system for the government to get money. There's no other way. So all taxes come through those channels. And then what do they do with it? Well, they buy weapons of mass destruction for security purposes usually. Where do they buy them? Well, they buy them from a business. Not always an American business, but usually they try to promote that. So they go to Guns R Us, a little company over in uh, New York, right? And they buy some weapons of mass destruction. So the government goes to the market system, so to speak, and buys from Guns R Us. So they're providing spending or money to the, those businesses. The White House needs people to mop the floors, clean the toilets, and do other things. And so they have to spend some money on those folks. They are employees of the government. We call them bureaucrats. And then there's elected officials that end up using up some of the resources too. But some of the land, labor, capital, entrepreneurship gets derailed up here to the White House. And in exchange, the government pay, writes them a paycheck or they pay for those resources. So that's the other way that the government comes into now the resource market for spending. So spending comes in two forms. They can spend money on weapons of mass destruction. They can spend money on natural resources or labor for people to work to them, right? So there's two sources of spending. And then finally, the big one that's been a big issue lately that we'll talk a lot about towards the end of the semester is this one, what I call G3. I like to call it Robin Hood spending. Robin Hood spending. Take from the rich, give to the poor was the old Robin Hood theory, right? Well, it goes further than that. So we've been doing lots of little Robin Hood deals. One of them is take, this one might hurt you a little bit, take from the young, give to the old. Take from the young, give to the old. What do we call that in the United States? Social Security is actually a tax and transfer program. There is no big retirement plan called Social Security that they, 
well, my portfolio has built up quite a long time. My social security has built up a value. Never been that. By the way, it's never been that since day one. It was never designed that way. It was always a take from the young, give to the old. It was always a transfer program. So social security is one. Take from the employed, give to the unemployed, right? So you guys on your paychecks have that little unemployment insurance? That's a transfer program. That's kind of a Robin Hood deal. Take from the employed, give to the unemployed. So we got all these types of uh, systems that have evolved over time in the general category of transfer payments. Uh, another classic one, take from the healthy, especially with Obamacare, give to the unhealthy, right? Through med when you get to be a senior, you've got Medicare. If you are disabled, you've got Medicaid if you're under the retirement age. So we have been providing free health care to a lot of folks. So take from the healthy, give to the unhealthy. That's another transfer that's uh, kind of under, under fire right now in the economy. All right, so that is our market system that we want to kind of keep in our heads. We'll reference back to this. That's why I think it's helpful if you bring that along to class. Even this picture is one we'll look at later. Um, I'm not going to go any further today other than to give you a little foreshadowing of how the, the plate of spaghetti grows. Then we've got the rest of the world with some exports and imports. In fact, that's kind of limited today. Maybe I'll just do this real quickly because it's not that big of a deal. So here's households, government, us. If we were in a closed economy, which some of your exercises will use that word, closed economy, it just means that we just have our own island. This is especially relevant with this Trump era that we're ushering in because he's kind of brought up these protectionist mentality. Let's build a wall, all right? If you leave my country, I'm going to tax you when you come back in, right? So that's, that's what economists call a protectionist view. So are we better off if we just had our own little island, if we just kind of isolated it? Well, the merits of trade work at the individual level the way I just showed you with the little uh, thing floating over and so forth, right? Win-win situation. Same thing's true at the country level. So we have benefits for both countries that we're going to explore more here yet today. Um, and that comes to us through importing and exporting. So when we buy something from China, as a, kind of the graphic that I have up there, but I also, I just call it row, rest of the world. So row is the rest of the world, wherever that's coming in from. And when we sell stuff to them, we're exporting. When we buy stuff from them, we're importing. So that's another uh, marketplace that kind of comes through this final goods market. It's another player in the, to really complete the picture. In an international, in a global market, we've got U.S. households, U.S. government, U.S. businesses, rest of the world. Rest of the world might be foreign governments and foreign businesses and foreign households, right? So that's kind of all just jumbled up those three players together up there in the cloud somewhere. All right. And then the next spot we'll go down the road is the financial markets. And look at how nice our plate of spaghetti is getting now. So this is financial markets. We're going to bring in borrowing and lending. That's all I'm going to do. I just wanted to Think about how important this is as we build it out. We started here with a free market, no government, added government, add the rest of the world, add financial markets. That's kind of how we're going to build up the course. All right. That's good enough for that. I think it's time to, whoops. All of this is in hopes that we can give you some ammunition to live a life. Remember, part of the objective I had was to see where do I fit into the big picture. You kind of got to know this big picture, and hopefully you guys can continue to have uh, uh, better dialogues and be a more informed uh, voter and an informed citizen to kind of help bring about uh, flourishing for other people. Uh, and this will certainly help you yourself, but in that, the way that self-interest kind of reaches out to other people too, this all plays an important role in that. All right, uh, so we're jumping into international economics, which is chapter seven. So that's chapter two. How many of you have got chapter two read? Okay, so that's how fast this course is moving, right? 
So I'm, not, I'm serious, you need to be on my icon lab, get in there, do the math, start to look at the homework, start to familiarize yourself. So if, you were a, if you're a reader, which I, I kind of encourage you to be, um, you should be through chapter two, probably now. So we're gonna get into chapter seven, is the international stuff right now. Now this international stuff, especially what I'm gonna do on the front end today, is uh, tied into the tail end of chapter two. So it's kind of tied into the tail end of chapter two with uh, the benefits trade. All right, so here we go. International economics. All right, so the basis for international trade is simply recognizing that countries are different. And then allowing each to specialize in those differences. The basis for international trade is simply recognizing that countries are different and allowing each to specialize in those differences. All right, so um, since I said them already, let me give you some of the, the lingo. So exports, which I'll kind of use capital EX, exports are goods or services sold to other countries. Goods, goods and services, which I'll kind of use the shorthand G and S. This is on the top part of our model, the goods, the final goods and services. At the output market, goods and services sold to other countries. And actually, let me, instead of other countries, let me put rest of the world. Sold to the rest of the world. The rest of the world, who we will affectionately call Roe from here on out. The rest of the world. And imports. Imports. I am are simply goods and services purchased from the rest of the world. Goods and services purchased from row. All right. So what types of differences are there? So start to imagine countries around the world. And let's just have a quick brainstorm of hopefully that, you know, the, the one thing I always love about international trade is the assumption. So in, in economics, you always have to be careful with, well, what's your assumptions? What's your underlying assumptions uh, that you're making about the conclusions you're drawing? And the assumption here is that countries are different. Now, is that a pretty crazy assumption, or is that pretty reasonable? Pretty darn reasonable, right? So how are they different? Types of differences. What do you think? Currency. Currency, OK. What else? Culture. Culture. Let me get somebody else in. What's your name? Oakley. Oakley? OK. What else? Raw materials. Like what? Give me some uh, examples that come to mind. Land, okay, and what about the land? Let me down a little bit. Think about land somewhere, land here, whatever. What's that? Okay, so the quality of the land, right? So if I, I moved from Iowa uh, when I was at Iowa State, so Iowa farm ground is pretty darn good for corn production, right? If you can compare Iowa to Missouri, there's a big difference on how good it is in terms of making crops, 
right? So the quality of land can be important. What else about the land category comes to mind? Maybe think of some other countries. I, I just brought up Iowa, but yeah, natural resources, but let me stick to land for a second. What are some other attributes of land? Picture a country, maybe something they grow. Maybe oil. we can't even grow them here. Oil. What's that? Oil. Oil, yeah. So part of the oil, so the minerals in the land. Minerals, quality, like we were just saying, right? Uh, climate. All those things kind of fall into that land category. So that one's easy. We don't, we, uh, the United States in general is not a good place to grow coffee as far as the coffee demand that we have in the United States or that has come to grow. And so we rely on South America for a lot of our coffee production, right? Part of that due to the climate and that it's conducive to growing coffee beans. All right, what else? Other differences. So you mentioned culture. That one could be added on to a little bit. Uh, trade laws or relationships. Good, good. Countries. Yeah, so laws. Let's put just slash government, right? Because that's part of... So the institutions that are in place in the form of laws uh, are a big difference on on uh, countries. What else? Differences between oh, rural Africa and rural America. So some things that come to mind with that visual. Rural Africa, rural America. Did you say labor of those units? Let me get what? I said labor. Labor is what I was kind of thinking. What about the labor though? We could talk quantities. I kind of purposely said rural Africa versus rural America, thinking, let's say the population is about the same. What would you think is probably different between rural Africa and rural America in terms of labor related to labor? Production rate uh, of what? Uh, uh, population birth rate type thing? Oh, how much they produce? Okay, good, which is related to what? Technology, good, and? The people, wages. Re religions, wages, wages. Yeah, well, the wages are going to be different, but what's driving that result? You guys are talking about things that are all tied together, by the way. So if you're more productive, the business is willing to pay more, a higher wage for that, right? And all of that's tied into what do you? The education is the buzzword I was looking for, right? The education levels in rural Africa versus rural America. I haven't looked at the data, but I can pretty much guarantee that our education system is kind of tops around the globe. So I was kind of picking on, on rural Africa, but that's true in rural India and, and rural other places around the globe, rural Central America for that matter. Our education levels are a lot higher. So our labor force tends to be more productive and therefore gets higher wages, okay? But all of that really comes down to uh, those results that you guys are about being more productive and about getting higher pay. That's a difference, but that difference was created through education levels, potentially, of the labor force. So let's put education of labor. And I'm going to sneak in that other word I mentioned last time, but we didn't write it down. Human capital is what economists call that, human capital. So we have cap capital, that is machines and buildings and computers and stuff. And then we got this idea that human beings come to us in different packages in terms of how productive they might be, and that's really getting at the heart of this human capital concept, kind of the quality of labor. All right, any other differences come to mind for uh, uh, countries, cross-country differences? How about, I wanted to come back to this culture. In what ways might culture, somebody other than Oakley? What's that? Religion, I think, is part of that. That might have different customs. If we go to uh, um, uh, the Middle East, where we've got uh, mostly Muslims, the culture there could be different, right? The customs, how, what, what are women in the labor force like? Well, I tell you what, you go to Saudi Arabia, the women are not in the labor force, if you've done any studying on, on culture that way, right? And so women in the workforce would be kind of a, a hot one around the globe. That, that's all, kind of all over the place. Um, it's changed a lot uh, in the United States um, uh, with labor force participation rates that we'll look at later when we come to the, some future chapters. So I don't want to belabor it too much now. 
but we'll look at participation rates of women. Women's been on up, men have actually come down. So that's kind of converged over time on the workforce composition. All right, other things. Anything else? Language. Language, good. I like that one. Be good on the, probably the culture. Um, I spent some time in India, did a couple student trips, and uh, there's like, I can't remember what the count is, over 3,000 languages in, in India. So Hindi is kind of the national language that most people know. Uh, a lot of people do know uh, English, uh, but each individual village, like you can travel 10 miles, 15 miles, and they'll speak a, a different local dialect. So the amount of languages in India is, is kind of crazy. And that factor could inhibit trade to some degree. If, if you can't communicate with people, uh, then that could be a barrier to trade, a barrier to these exchanges that we that we know we could maybe be doing. Okay, this is a pretty good list. Anything burning in your belly that you wanted to add to the board? All right, so one reason to trade. So we're kind of, I'm trying to develop um, this, you know, why do we trade? What are the reasons for trade? And one reason to trade, so note, kind of key point, uh, one reason to trade is to get things we cannot make ourselves. So let me go to my Canadians here. I got a couple here. Is there another Canadian or Canadians? Oh, two Canadians. So we got four Canadians. All right, let me go to the Canadian contingent. Let me come to the back of the room. How is how many people do you know? What city you're from? Vancouver. So how many banana growers do you know in Vancouver? None, right? So no bananas. How about oranges? Some oranges, okay? So yeah, you kind of got the California, and all you probably have to do a little trade, but some people can grow some of, maybe some of their own oranges there, right? Coffee? Not, Not so much, right? So some things, and, and where are you guys from again? You were in Vancouver. Oh, you're Vancouver too, okay. So you go to uh, Montreal and Toronto and some other areas that are, let, are uh, colder than Vancouver, and uh, there's a lot of things you can't make yourself. So all of a sudden, oh yeah, well, I'm okay with international trade as long as we can't make it ourselves, but otherwise I want my people to be making it, is the argument, right? So this reason to trade is usually digestible by just about everybody. Like, oh, okay, well, as long as we're not displacing labor in Vancouver by buying bananas, then I suppose that's okay for us to buy some bananas <coughs> from, from other places, right? All right, so that's one reason that seems to make sense. Um, so, the reasons are bigger than that. So the argument for trade that we're going to make is that the reason you want to trade is to make yourself better off. In other words, the fact that you guys are buying bananas in Vancouver is not costing you any money or you're not that your your thought that maybe on well at least I'm not screwing over the Vancouver labor force by doing that is simply not true when we look at the bigger picture of uh, trade and in a broader context. Alright, so um there is so this is kind of note number two. We're gonna start off with there is an opportunity cost. There is an opportunity cost to producing anything. There's an opportunity cost to producing any product. So the definition for opportunity cost, one of them that will work, but I'm going to probably give you two. So opportunity cost is the cost of something 
the cost of something measured in terms of what was given up to produce an additional unit. The cost of something measured in terms of what was given up, what was given, I forgot my up, what was given up to produce an additional unit. All right, now I'm hoping that a few bells and whistles are going on for those of you who had micro. When we saw the word additional, what word were we thinking maybe simultaneously could be exchanged? Which one? Come on, I know you can do it. Don't be bashful. Additional units. So the cost of an additional unit, what kind of cost was that? Marginal. Marginal, right? That marginal word. So the cost of an additional unit, so this is kind of a marginal cost. So let's put in parentheses a marginal cost. The way I've got that phase, when we do it to an additional unit, we're thinking about marginal cost. All right, so the argument here is that there's a cost to doing anything. Anything you do, we can think about, well, what did you give up to do it? What was given up to do it? So another working definition for opportunity cost is the highest valued alternative foregone. The highest valued alternative foregone. The highest valued alternative foregone. Okay, so if um, if you didn't come to class today, what would you be doing? So what would you be doing if you didn't come to class today? If you with an answer, I'm going to point the finger, and I want your answer. I want your answer nice and loud. So if you didn't come to class today, what would you be doing? What's your name? Gray. Green. Green. What would you be doing? You were in class today, class started at 11 o'clock. Once to 1240, you still got almost a half hour. What would you be doing? Think, what, what are some things you do with your life? Sleep. Sleep, okay. So would that be it? Would you be a late sleeper? Can you take a little nap? All right, let's go with that. I'll give you that. Eating. Sleeping, eating. Uh, watching Netflix. Good. Sleeping. Video games. All right, so we've got <laughs> video games, sleep, eat, and Netflix. Now, is that Netflix and chill or Netflix? <laughs> <laughs> I think I knew that one, didn't you? I had that. Yeah. Okay, so those are some possibilities, right? So we got these things. Now, um, let me go back to Bree. Do you do all four of those things at different times? Have you games? I don't know if I'm sure not everybody's game or not. But you played video games before, right? I mean, is that a priority in your life or not? Or not so much. But you agree all three of them, all four of those things are possibilities for you, right? So the, the main point I want to drive home here is that on a multiple choice question on a test, if you're asked, well, what is the opportunity cost for Bree? It's not all four of these things, it's only one. It's the thing she didn't do. Right? So opportunity cost is always your highest 
valued alternative. It's the thing you would have done if you didn't do what you did. And that's my Dr. Seuss version of it that I'll, I'll write on the board. It's the thing you would have done if you didn't do what you did. That is what opportunity cost is. And so as long as these things, so opportunity, another important point here is that opportunity cost, the cost of something varies across individuals because these things aren't people, right? So we had some people that were going to be asleep, some were going to eat, some were going to Netflix and chill, right? So all those things aren't equal, but they were all equally viewed as the cost. So costs are subjective. Values are subjective. Right? And that was kind of the story of this thing. When I bought it for $3, the value that I had on it was at least $3 worth of value. Values reside with you. Values are subjective. And so that plays into this opportunity cost. Opportunity cost is kind of circumstantial. It depends on the individual. When we were in micro class, it depended on the circumstances maybe of the company, on whether they should do some sort of decision. So opportunity cost is kind of a depends thing. But one thing it's not, it's not all of these things. It's not all the potential things. So get, let me give you my last four, which is Russ's Dr. Seuss version. Opportunity cost is the thing, the thing you would have done the thing you would have done if you didn't do what you did. So this is the Dr. Seuss version. Uh, by Russ. You won't find that in any textbook. I made that one up. Okay. Here's a teaching. Brought that insight to me there. All right. So where do we go from here? So we've got this thing that we all have different costs. We can measure things in terms of what we were giving up. And so the premise of international trade is this. So I want to, before we get into the specific model, I want you to think about, does this make sense? Hopefully it will, but at times it won't. Does this make sense? <laughs> we should produce things, oops, produce things, real formal words here, Produce things that we have a lower opportunity cost in. And these are going to be things we're good at. Things that we're good at. You were talking about being uh, productive before. I'm sorry, give me a name again. Jen. So Jenna brought up being productive. Some people are better at other things. So in an hour's worth of time, we can think about the things we're good at as, wow, I can spend an hour's worth of time doing this, and I'm more productive than somebody else, which would mean you have a lower opportunity cost in that. You have to give up less time. In other words, if Melanie's the one that's less productive, she'd have to work for two hours while Jenna works for one hour, right? So. Melanie has to give up two hours of her life. Jenna has to give up one hour of her life. So we start thinking in terms of, well, what do you have to give up to do what you're going to do? And so this statement says, let's produce things that we have a lower opportunity cost in, things we're good at, and trade for things we have a high opportunity cost in. These are things we suck at. So we're going to determine things we 
are relatively good at compared to the rest of the world is where we're going with this, but this works at the individual level too. Find the things, identify the things that we are a low cost provider of, trade for the things that we're not a low cost provider of, the high cost things relative to us. So this is the principle of comparative advantage. This is the principle of comparative advantage. Comparative advantage, CA, we might use that a little bit later. Comparative advantage. So me, if the idea is me comparing to you, have an advantage over you on it. All right, so. Our first economic model in the class coming up. So this is called the Ricardian trade model. Originally put forth by a guy named David Ricardo. Kind of an interesting story. Uh, so he was um, late 1700s uh, into the 1800s. And he was trying to convince the king of England to trade with France. So we had kind of France and England. This is a true story. Uh, I think it was chicken and wine was the example that he used. And so he came to the king and said, hey, uh, I know you're good at everything, right? You're good and us lowly French people might not be able to, to help you out that much. But let me show you something. See if you can get this. And this is what this is what he showed him was this was this model. So this is called the Ricardian trade model, which is really the model of comparative advantage. So here's our assumptions. We've got two countries, the USA and Japan. We've got two goods, for simplicity, food, and cars. And then we're going to have one resource, one factor of production, and that is going to be labor. And we're going to build a table to show production. So kind of build a little four square box. And we're going to put the US here on the top and Japan down here. And we'll put food up top and cars here. And then inside the boxes, we're going to have productivity, like Jenna was bringing up. How much can each country make? How much can each person make? Some measure of productivity. And so in the United States, we've got <coughs> four foods for every worker. So every unit of labor can produce four units of food. So this is our notation, four units of food per unit of labor. So we got F over F, right? And that same American, if we put them into car production, could do eight cars for every labor. All right, then we look over to Japan. And if we look at one Japanese person, that person can do five food for every unit of labor. Or if we put that uh, Japanese person into car production, they can do 25. 25 cars for every <coughs> Japanese worker. 
All right, so one little thing for notation purposes that's going to help us out when we come back to currency. One of you guys mentioned currency on your differences. Um, we're going to let put a little asterisk by Japan, since we're in the United States currently. We're going to call them the foreign country. So the little asterisk denotes foreign country. And that'll kind of come in handy later when we might be talking about uh, the British pound or the Canadian dollar versus the American dollar. All right. So, what can you tell me about this data? What what jumps out at you? Japan's better at what? Japan dominates us, right? So, in terms of productivity, productivity of our labor force. Japan's doing something right. You know, we talk about education and technology. Something within their society has made their population, their labor force, more productive than the Americans in both goods. So the question is, why would the Japanese want to trade with the United States? They're better at both things. Right? Why would they want to trade? So had I, don't, don't write this on your paper, but had I did this, if this would have been a three, then all of a sudden we'd be looking at this, oh, I get it, yeah, Japanese, you guys make the cars, we'll make the food, and then we'll trade, right? But what Ricardo did to the King of England on that story is he came back and said, hey, King of England, you're better than us at both things. I'm not going to deny it. Or let's just assume you were that. He was trying to fluff them up to, to get them to go and trade. So he really stacked the deck against potentially international trade, right? The deck is stacked, so to speak. But why would Japan want to trade? They're better at, at the United States. So what we call this, there is a name for this. It's called an absolute advantage. So Japan, this is a note. Japan has... An absolute, absolute advantage in production. In general, they're better at both things. So they're better at producing both goods on average when we look at labor productivity. I think it's worthwhile to put that down since we'll be talking, especially in macro class, a little bit more about this. So these are, this is a measure of productivity, right? So um, labor productivity could be a variable that we use where it's just simply number of units of output divided by number of units of input. And that's what we got going on here. We narrowed it down to a per person level, but we'll also, also do this sometimes through average productivity. If I produce 80 units and I had 10 labors working on it, to 80, so 80, and I had 10 people working, 80 divided by 10 is 8. On average, per person, I get 8 cars per unit of labor. Right? So that's a measure of labor productivity that we'll use in this class later. We can look at those statistics uh, across the economy. All right, any questions so far? All right, so we got the deck stacked. So the next step here, I'm going to get rid of this. All right, everybody got this? Units of output over units of input. Um, I want to look at opportunity cost. So how are we going to do that? Um, so if Japan's better at both, then we got to put in our big but. That don't matter. That don't matter for trade to be beneficial. For trade to be 
beneficial for both countries. All right, so if I write this here, you guys can still see me all the way up to here. Oh, man, I can do that. Okay. So sometimes I have that video camera too far over, I can't see it. So let's assume further that the United States is twice as big as Japan. The United States is twice as big. Let's give the United States. Um, so let's look at production possibilities. So first of all, let me put this here. Let's look at production possibilities. Frontiers, PPS, that's a word that we'll need to know, be comfortable with. Let's look at production possibilities, frontiers, in each country. Assuming we've got labor in the United States of 2,000 and L star is 1,000. So we've got 1,000 people in Japan, 2,000 people in the United States. All right, so here we go. We're going to draw two graphs side by side with each other. Draw them kind of nice and big for yourself. On the graph to our left, we've got the United States of America. On the graph to our right, we've got Japan. In the United States, on the vertical axis, we are going to have cars being measured. And on the horizontal axis, food. Same thing in Japan, C star and F star. So, what are the production possibilities? What does that thing look like if the United States was to devote all of their resources to car production? How many cars could they have? Um, well, I was, well, I was sorry. I was you wanted to ask, take it a different direction? Well, I was going to ask another question. Okay, go ahead, yeah. So, basically, it'd be more profitable for Japan to put all, almost all all that we're in car production and then take the smaller loss by buying food from us. Yeah, I mean, th that's kind of what we want to reason through, but okay. I want to do it in kind of a systematic way. And you don't quite have it all the details, but it sounds like your gut feeling is, is there, is good. So let's take it in baby steps. If the United States devotes all their resources to car production, how many cars can they make? Well, I heard a different answer over here. 16,000, right? So 16,000. Why? On average, each person can produce eight cars. How many people do we got? 2,000. Eight times 2,000 is 16,000. So on this, try to make some even slashes here. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. I should have kind of kept that. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Just to kind of keep my scale down. But try to make even slashes on your paper so that graphically it comes out, especially since this is our first one and maybe the first time for many of you even attempting an economic graph, we'll try to be extra careful. We might get sloppier later, but let's try to be careful now. All right, so one production possibility for the United States is 16,000 cars, but how food can they have if they do that? Zero. So the production possibility is 16 and zero. 
If instead we take our whole labor force and devote it to food production, what can we have? 8,000. So for the Americans, one person on average can produce four units of food. I have 2,000 workers. So this is measured in thousands, sorry, I should probably put that up here. 16,000 is that endpoint. So I can have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So measuring food in thousands. Another possibility is to have 8,000 units of food but zero cars. What's another production possibility? Split them up. Well, where would that put me? If I split up my labor force, that'd be fair. 8,000 what? 8,000 cars and 4,000 food, right? So I just have 1,000 in each. So that's another possibility. Now, tell me something. If you use your slashes really carefully, where will this dot be placed? Right in the middle and... Like this dot's in the middle, that dot's in the middle, that dot's in the middle. A straight line is kind of what I was looking for. So at eight and one, two, three, four, dot, 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 dot. If you guys drew this really carefully, all three of these should be in a line. And you can see I wasn't even very good at it. It's kind of close, but I probably needed to be out here a little bit more. But your slashes might have been off. But in theory, we can be anywhere along this line using this number and that is I'll just make my dot a little fatter that's a little trick that you can use just make a bigger fatter dot if you do. but I would like you to have that be a straight line <laughs> okay so that works there um, let's go over to Japan what does their production possibilities look like? What is their end point for car production? 25,000, right? So now we only have 1,000 people, but each person can do 25 on average, giving us 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25. Woo up there ways. Okay. So 25. And then where are they at with um yeah they would be at zero, right? But if I take the thousand workers and I devote them to food production, five thousand, right? So again we're measuring in thousands. And I don't want to forget that. Sometimes that happens on the on your homework problems too. Make sure you're paying attention to the units of measurement. If it's millions or billions or trillions or whatever. So we're going to go, you can make these a little bigger if you want, just to spread it out, but it doesn't really matter. One, two, three, four, five. All right. And again, the Japanese could be anywhere in between. All right, so what does this help us think about within each country? If you look at those graphs, talk to me about trade-offs. Let's start with those Americans. If you look at those trade-offs, what, what's what are some possibilities of production trade-offs for the United States? They just, no, that's not giving me a trade-off, though. So if they just produce food, I, I want you to hone in on the trade-offs possible. The Americans could be at point A, B, or C, or D, or E, or F, or G, or H, or I, or whatever, right? Everybody agree they could be anywhere along here. Those are all production possibilities. So talk to me in terms of the trade-offs that the Americans face. Put that into a sentence for me, like... If I want more food, 
what's the trade I have to make internally? We're ignoring Japan. We're just on our own little island now. We have to give up some cars. How much? So if I want one more unit of food, how many cars do I have to give up? Two. Two, right? Or vice versa, if I want another car, how much food do I have to give up? Careful, that half, right? So there's this two for one trade-off. So if we're kind of calculating trade-offs, so let's make a little note to ourselves. Note, USA trade-offs internally, if you will, kind of ignoring. We've got two cars equals one food. Or equivalently, what you just said is one car equals, well, there's my equal sign, do a little simple algebra here. What I do to one side of the equation, I divide by two to get a one here. What I do to one side, I got to do to the other, and I get one half. All right, so important for you to get that math test done tomorrow by tomorrow night. So get on my econ lab, make sure you're comfy with all this stuff. All right, how about for the Japanese? Japan trade-offs. One food cost me one food. If I want one more food, wherever I'm at, A, B, C, D, right, anywhere along here, one more food is going to cost me five cars. Woo! Kind of an expensive piece of steak, right? So the trade-off that face is five cars equals uh, one food, or we can equivalently think that one car costs me a fifth of food. What's the slope of this line? Those of you who have passed the math test or just know otherwise. What's the slope of the production possibilities frontier? Two. Rise over run, down 16 over 8. The slope is 2. Huh, that's kind of tying into our production possibilities, our trade-offs. Slope of this line? 5. Down 5, down 25 over 5. However you cut it, the slope of that line is 5. All of that plays into the trade-offs. Who does food cheaper? Who does food cheaper? Cheaper, the United States or Japan? Who does food cheaper? U.S. U.S. In the United States, they only have to give up two cars, while the Japanese have to give up five. Guess who should be producing food and trading for cars? U.S. The U.S. That's where we'll pick up next time. <laughs> Thank you.